Uh, good afternoon, my name is Emilka Vargas and I will do the presentation about the parallel risk preparedness for the conservation of archaeological and natural heritage in the case of Palenque, a war heritage site in southeast Mexico. I am a PhD candidate here in the University of Barcelona and member of the group of public archaeology and heritage and uh, funded by the National um, Commission of Science and Technology of Mexico, my born country. Well, oh, sorry, what I, I did? <coughs> yeah, well, the content of my presentation is divided in three. The first, uh, I will discuss about the management and risk preparedness in World Heritage Sites, what is in the UNESCO policies, and the second is the case study of the pre Hispanic city and national park of Palenque. And finally, I will um, show you some suggested guidelines to improve the risk preparedness uh, that is being carrying on in Mexico, in this site concretely. Well, in the World Heritage Convention, in the article number five, it, is it was established that the state parties should to um, give the cultural and natural heritage a function in the life of the community and also to have comprehensive planning programs where risk preparedness is included. In the management systems, uh, following the operational guidelines of 2017, the state parties also, when they um, nominate sites, they should have an appropriate <coughs> management plan, and this management plan, management plan should be preferably developed through participatory means. And I will highlight participation because it's uh, the project that we are developing. And in the guideline 118, it's established that the committee, the World Heritage Committee, recommends that the state parties include the risk preparedness as an element in their World Heritage Site Management Plans and Training Strategies. Well, however, last but not least, well, uh, in, the nom in the nomination, it's mandatory now to include natural disaster and risk preparedness, main, uh, mainly of natural, natural phenomena. And also in 2007, UNESCO launched the, a UNESCO strategy for reducing risk for, from disasters at World Heritage properties. So in this strategy, they established five objectives. The first is to strengthen the support within relevant global, regional, national, and local institutions. And I highlight local because it's at, at the level that I am working now. They use the knowledge, innovation, and education to build the, array, the culture of disaster prevention, identify, assess, and monitor disaster risk at work as properties, reduce underlying uh, the risk factors at these sites, and last, uh, lastly, to strengthen the disaster preparedness at work heritage sites for effective response at all levels. It includes the local level. Well, in this is a strategy, I will highlight two actions. One of them is that um, they should take in, into account the community members for strength this capacity in, for risk preparedness in more heritage uh, sites. And in the action 4.2, also to develop social training program for communities living within or around the war heritage, even if they don't live in the borders of the war heritage site, but if they live around, they should be included in the social training, in social training programs. So what we do in Mexico is to compare what says the UNESCO policies with what is doing Mexico in their archaeological sites. So we compare the UNESCO policy with Mexican implementation, and for this presentation I will highlight what they do in the case of Palenque for the risk preparedness. We have three research questions. In what areas and up to what extent do local people participate? The second is what's the social impact of inscription of the site in the World Heritage List? And the third question is how is the relationship between the site's managers and also the local communities? Well, our case studies uh, are four. These are the 35 World Heritage Sites in Mexico, and we choose the archaeological sites of Teotihuacan, El Tajín, Calakmul, and Palenque. About Palenque, it's, um, well, for the research, we, we follow some ethnographic tools uh, in focus group, um, participant observation, um, interviews in depth, in depth interviews. And in the case of Palenque, uh, we developed this methodology in this site, which was inscribed in 1987. Um, it has a very small site, about 1,700 hectares. Uh, it's a national park, and over 90% of the local people are indigenous. 
The site is located six kilometers from the current city of Palenque, the modern city of Palenque. Uh, I have to say Palenque is a Mayan site which was inhabited between the centuries, the, the centuries uh, uh, seven and nine. It was abandoned and it was rediscovered in, in uh, 17, 1917, uh, 17th century. So it's uh, six kilometers from the current city of Palenque, but there are two indigenous communities, villages living just next to the national park. In this site with, that we can see from the plane, uh, and they go every day and they have the work here, as I will show you some slides. Well, and this is uh, the Wojeta's property. It doesn't have a buffer zone, so it's all uh, the Wojeta sites. And what we see here is the archaeological elements of the national park. But the, it is also inscribed based on Mexican uh, legislation as a national park and as a, an archaeological zone. This 1,700 hectares. But if we overlap this map with the Google Maps, we see that half of this national park is used for cattle and for agriculture and not for specifically uh, natural heritage conservation. And well, the attraction of Palenque is not a national park, it's the archaeological site, uh, the pyramid of Pakal, the temple of um, the palace, and also one of the elements of the attraction is the beautiness and the, combi the combination of this idyllic and romantic idea of the archaeological site in the middle of the jungle that attracted a lot of uh, travelers in the 19th century. But now it's managed by two different institutions. The National Institute of um, History and Anthropology, which was established in 1939, and the National Commission of Protected Areas, established in 2000. So each of these has a completely different approach to the site. They should protect this, the same amount of the, the, the same territory, but Palenque has uh, the policies followed. The, the policies followed by Palenque by the INA is um, to protect the archaeological elements, and the CONAMP is to protect the natural resources. So you don't see INA personnel inside the pyramids, the archaeological site, and we don't see uh, personnel of the archaeological site in the uh, rest of the national park. So at the entrance, they are completely different signs, so they give different information to the visitors, they have different fees, and you have to pay them in different pa part of the, of, the, of the national park. So what, I, what we have found uh, is that the risk preparedness of INA is just for cultural heritage, and for Kodam is just for natural heritage. The main threat identified in both are anthropogenic. However, for the INA is the housing and tourism infrastructure, the threat for heritage, and for the CONAM is the massive tourism and the cattle in half of the national park. There is no management plan implemented in Palenque, and the management plan in CONAM has been delayed because there is an error in the inscription of the national park in the Mexican legislation. It's a technical problem, but that's why they have not developed the management plan yet. So there are no such a participation in risk preparedness activities, and actually there is no participation in any decision-making process in the site. And the social participation in CONAP is only in very uh, specific moments, and there are um, public consultations. So the law established that they have to be um, public consultation with local communities, and they do that, but it's, um, it's not compulsory to uh, follow the conclusion of the local, of the social um, agreement. So the INA has a program for risk preparedness, it's called PREF-INA, Prevention of uh, INA. And the CUNAP has a wide training on risk preparedness because since the threat, even if the threat is uh, anthropogenic, uh, they have to protect all the, uh, the whole uh, national, um, national heritage. So they are more trained by geologists and, and um, well, biologists. They are more aware of risk, on risk preparedness. And there is no official publication of management plans, but in CONAM, it's mandatory to have a po um, an official publication, but as I explained before, uh, the management plan has not been uh, developed. So, some uh, suggested guidelines, and these are my last, last slide for this presentation. Well, some of them are very obvious, but even if they're obvious, they have not been following since 1987. 
And one of them is to start a dialogue process with local communities to deal with risk preparedness and management issues, to develop a long-term capacity building program to raise awareness among not only well, with INA and CONAM personnel, but also with the representative of the local communities, to open up the participation of local authorities' representatives. Um, and uh, we consider that risk preparedness can be the first step for further co contribution and collaboration with local communities. And also, it, it's very important to translate the risk preparedness information into indigenous languages. So the indigenous, over 98% of the people living next to the um, site are indigenous, Mayan indigenous people. Uh, it would be very useful to translate it into their languages. They are bilingual, though they speak Spanish too. Um, but to have it translated into indigenous languages can increase the engagement with the local communities. Um, and last but not least, it would be necessary to highlight the international relevance of, of rich preparedness in war heritage, as a war heritage. Because uh, people in Kunan, people in Ina, they don't. Um, are very aware of what war heritage inscription means, what are their obligations, and what are their opportunities, not for funding, because UNESCO is lack of funds, but also for other opportunities to develop exchanges with other war heritage sites, or uh, based on UNESCO guidelines to access to international resources of, for, in this case, risk preparedness. And, well, last uh, acknowledgement of my supervisor of the, this, this PhD research. Uh, Professor Margarita Diaz Andreu and Xavi Ruyel, the local partners at the World Heritage Sites and community members, sites managers, and members of the public archaeology and heritage group, and uh, uh, some of the institutions that has been collaborating with this research. So with that said, uh, thank you very much.